Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the inaugural formerly incarcerated innovation and entrepreneurship program brought to you by the US Patent and Trademark Office. My name is Carlos Gutierrez, Innovation Outreach Specialist for National Programs, and I'll be your MC today. We're going to go ahead and get started with a message from Kathy Vidal, Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the US Patent and Trademark Office. Thank you for your kind introduction. And thank you to everyone for participating in this important event. This gathering is the first of its kind for the US Patent and Trademark Office, and it won't be the last. Incarceration and rehabilitation are not traditional issues at the USPTO, but they go to the core of what our agency does. We provide legal protection for those who have novel ideas for new products and services so that they can get started in fulfilling careers. There are close to 2 million people behind bars and millions more who used to be. We can help you become inventors and entrepreneurs. We can provide you with the tools and resources you need to develop your great ideas for a new business, your intellectual property, into new products. We can help you realize your dreams. By helping you achieve your potential as innovators, this will boost the U.S. economy and benefit your families and communities in which you live. Registering patents and trademarks is the first step in starting a new business, raising capital, and hopefully hiring employees to do all the work that you can't do by yourself. The USPTO has programs to help those who are new to innovation. We can help you apply for a patent or trademark. Our patent pro bono program, which means there are no charges for legal services that are provided, is expanding. 35% of the participants in our pro bono program are black, 14% are Hispanic. The annual budget for this program has more than doubled this year to $1.2 million. We also have more than 60 law schools that provide free legal services to those in their communities who don't know how to file for a patent application and can't afford an attorney. We have substantially reduced fees for anyone filing as an individual or who works for a small company or organization. All of these programs and others aimed at new inventors and entrepreneurs are well utilized. Thousands of people are taking advantage of them. We want you to take advantage of them as well. I look forward to hearing your suggestions for what we can do to help in any way that we can. But more than anything else, I hope that you can take advantage of the intellectual property rights that are guaranteed to you in the U.S. Constitution. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy your sessions. Thank you for those inspiring remarks, Director Ridal. Next, we're going to hear from Aisha McCain with Casual Recovery Enterprises for a fireside chat. Thank you for having me, Carlos. This is a wonderful opportunity, and I'm excited to be here. Excellent. We're, we're happy to have you. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, having you tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Ooh, okay. <laughs> My journey has been very untraditional. Um, I left home at 14. I ran away when I was 14 and um, never looked back. As a 14 year old runaway, you don't have a lot of options in life. You can't like get a job or sustain yourself. So I sold drugs. Um, and then I went to prison for selling drugs for five years. Um, I remember I was sitting in prison and, you know, they have these classes like, what are you going to do with your life and job skills? And I'm like, I don't have any. And they're like, actually, you do. You are good at customer service, inventory, sales. You know, you have skills. So I got my GD in prison. I came home in 2005. In 2008, I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer that had metastasized to my lymph nodes. Um, so I had chemo, radiation, and some surgeries. Um, and then I went on with life. And then in 2017, I was re-diagnosed with um, DCIS breast cancer. So I opted to have a double mastectomy. I knew that when I had this surgery, I was going to have surgical drains. So 
I had was familiar with having surgical drains from prior surgeries and I knew I was going to have like this tube hanging out of my body with like a bulb the size of a lemon full of like biological matter and they were going to tell me to safety pin this to the outside of your clothes and when I had done it before like my niece was scared of me I couldn't I just felt gross it's really disgusting so I went to a seamstress and I was like here's a lemon Here's what I need. I need you to sew interior pockets in these places. And I strictly was thinking of my own comfort at that time. And I had a garment made for myself. And when I was being discharged from um, UCSF, my surgeon, um, Dr. Hani Spatani, saw it and he was like, you're an inventor. And I was like, what? I was so sick. And I was like, no, I'm not. And he was like, yes, other patients need this. You should pursue this, you know, and I'll, I'll mentor you on this. So that, that, that's where kind of it, it was birthed. So I just went home. I, I watched a lot of Shark Tank. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot of what not to do and not what to do. And I, um, I had a lot of complications after that. So that one surgery, turned into like 14 surgeries. Um, so over that four year period, I was just like, okay, I'm going to get a patent, you know, and people were like, you'll never get a patent on pockets. And how are you going to do it? And I just, you know, friends and family, my brother, he didn't even know what I was doing. He didn't really understand it. But he was like, if this makes you happy, here's some money, hire somebody to get a patent. So I was like, well, you know, go big or go home. We're going to get FDA registration. We're going to get medical insurance reimbursement. I'm going to ask my surgeon to do a medical study on it. And, you know, all of that came to fruition. I was issued my utility patent in ICU after my breast reconstruction surgery. I got the call like, you got your patent. Um, we did get FDA registration. We got an insurance reimbursement code. My surgeon did a study at UCSF on 30 patients. They recovered faster. They felt more comfortable and it just brought back dignity. Um, so that was the first one. And in this time, I had a dear friend, Dr. Emery Sheets, that I met in the emergency room 15 years ago. And she, you know, became my co-founder and my chief medical officer. And so that was that was the first invention that came to fruition. And then, you know, the universe just brought me this amazing team and more patents have been filed and received since then. Great, thank you for that terrific overview. Um, this is kind of, uh, you know, personal for me as well as, uh, as you recall, when we, when we first um, had our initial discussion, I mentioned that my, my wife has the same uh, issue. So I, I mean, First, thank you for such a great innovation. Um, she's going through it, you know, exactly right now. So it's it's uh, interesting that we were able to uh, make this connection with you and hear about these terrific innovations. Also, I know from our, re our recent discussions as well, you mentioned that you have three approved patents in the last four months. So congratulations on that. Also, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the additional patents and the additional um, work that's associated with your uh, initial in innovation? Yes. So um, obviously 14 surgeries over a four year period, I was really bored and this gave me a purpose. And I realized, wow, I'm, I'm actually an inventor. I can change the world. So with the um, drain garment, a quarter of all surgeries require drains. It's really gross. So, you know, that is to change a standard of care. So I was like, okay, what about kids? You know what? I'm going to put a superhero cape on the pediatric garment. I'm going to find some super pediatric superheroes and put them on the garment. And I looked for them and none existed. So I was like, I got to do everything. No, I got to do everything. But I so saw I created young superheroes. So they're like this magical, diverse crew of like pediatric superheroes. And they're really amazing and they're super cool. We have a a coloring book out now. So I created the young superheroes during this time and I got that copy written and trademarked. Um, and then, so my other innovation, my sister died from an asthma attack. Actually, yesterday was August 30th is the day she died and September 2nd is her birthday. She had a roommate down the hall and um, 
she passed out from lack of oxygen and couldn't call for air. So I usually am really upset at that time of year. Um, a couple of years ago, I was like, I'm, I got to solve this. So um, I invented a smart skin, like a rubber skin that would go over the existing asthma inhaler, EpiPen, diabetic shot, any kind of emergency medication. It is connected to a fob or a Bluetooth device on the phone. Um, so if a person is leaving their house without their emergency device, they'll be alerted. You're leaving your inhaler behind. If a person cannot find their inhaler, they can do the Find My. It'll make a loud alarm. It'll also flash lights for the hearing impaired and vibrate extremely strongly for the hearing and visually impaired. And if a person is using their emergency device, their inhaler or their EpiPen, and they're not getting the relief they need, they can press the button on the side. It will call 911 with GPS triangulation and a pre-recorded message that a person is either in breathing distress, anaphylactic shock. Um, so it'll call emergency services as well as make a really loud alarm where they are. So if someone's in another room, they can come help. They'll be aware of it. That was um, allowed in April and it's actually issuing September 6th. And with that, um, I actually just filed another a continuation in part on that, which is an everyday hero app so that everybody that's connected on this network can opt in and their information will be masked. But if you're having an emergency, you can unmask yourself if you don't have your device and it'll send an alert to everybody that's within the vicinity. Hey, there's somebody, you know, on aisle four of the grocery store that needs an inhaler. Do you have one? And so it's kind of like the everyday hero. Everybody can help everybody app. Um, I also was just recently allowed uh, the pediatric garment for the drain garment, which has different pockets because kids might do a somersault. So with the pediatric garment, we have trapezoidal pockets so they the drains can go in but lay a certain way so that kids, you know, jumping around or moving around won't dislodge them. Um, and another CIP on the drain garment, which um, just strengthened our claims. Um, on the uh, original patent. So I have a patent family with three patents on the post-surgical drain garment. And then I have like four or five other patents pending. Well, I would like to hear a little bit. I know you probably don't want to share too much about the, the patents pending, but uh, you can maybe get into that a little bit. But uh, before that, I, I wanted to say it's really terrific that you mentioned the the copyright and the trademark as well, um, because it's it's that's that's a good topic for folks to know that USPTO can provide information on. And later in the program, we're going to have some internal USPTO uh, subject matter experts come in and talk about a little bit of those. So uh, I'm glad to hear that you're, you you have those things as well. Um, so uh, next, I, I'd like to know, I think it'd be valuable. What, what do you think were the challenges that you had along this journey, both as it applies to the intellectual property acquisition and or uh, some of the challenges associated with developing the businesses, getting started, right? Like things that you had to, you know, do research on that you weren't aware of or things that, that just presented uh, some hurdles that you overcame. Sheesh, um, so many, right? When I first started this, um, one of my advisors and partners, Bert Sagai, and he, he, I was telling them, like, I can't be a CEO. I don't, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. And, you know, just having people around to mentor me every day. I learn every day we learn. Right. So I've just been learning and soaking up information like a sponge. So just, I, I had to get over the fact that I didn't believe in myself that I thought there was a stigma attached to my past that people would judge me based on that and say, well, who do you think you are? You know, you went to prison for selling drugs and now you're inventing medical stuff. And um, so I had to get over my own self-doubt. That was a huge challenge for me, as well as, you know, just having medical challenges along the way. And I mean, you have to master the art of the pivot, right? So there are going to be challenges when you file a patent. There are going to be challenges when we do anything in life. But if you really believe in something and nothing that nothing that's great comes easy right you don't change the world just because you woke up one day and you did one action nothing that's great comes easy you have to persevere even if you have your low moments you have to just like i just 
I had to be my own cheerleader and I had a community of people cheering for me as well. But internally, I had to just sitting here right now, right? Having this interview, I would have never imagined that this was my, you know, that I would find my purpose in my pain and I would go from taking a mug shot to taking a, a head shot. You know, it's just, it's just mind blowing. And I, there have been, you know, an abundance of challenges, but we all have challenges, right? But if you believe in something really strongly, nothing can stop you. So, you know, we had challenges of prior art that we had to overcome. Um, and we had to explain what is the utility? Why is this an innovation? You know, um, we had, you know, challenges of finding the right person to follow the patent and kind of navigating that process because you see all these commercials on TV, but they're like, I mean, they that wasn't for me, you know, like they basically own your stuff. And I really wanted to build generational wealth. I wanted to change the world, but also change the lives of the people around me. So finances were a challenge, you know, fundraising was a challenge. Um, just to get the funding to continue to do things from, man, I've done everything, friends and family. I'm just now currently meeting with investors. So that, that's been a huge challenge. And just getting polished up on on this, you know, on, on this path of being a good leader, understanding, showing compassion, you know? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Those are all great points you hit on there uh, associated with uh, some very common challenges that folks have. Um, one of the things that I wanted to know, and you touched on it briefly is uh and you mentioned early on that you have a you, you had partnered with a physician you're now partner uh in the business who were some of the other folks that you enlisted as mentors and what organizations did you did you depend on to help you as you as you moved the innovation forward and excuse me forward for with advice or uh with technical assistance and things like that so um bert sagayan um is brilliant. He's an attorney and he's an amazing mentor to me. Um, Paula Fotenhauer is my chief production officer and she is just a brilliant fairy godmother of a, you know, for the garment pattern maker. So I don't have to worry about anything. Amory, Dr. Sheet, she's, she's just amazing. And she's a friend. She's my friend and my partner. And we're, we're great co-creators. Um, I joined Black Girl Ventures during the pandemic and that really like elevated me because when I first joined Black Girl Ventures, I didn't know how to pitch and I'm just like, I'm a girl from the hood. I don't know, you know, how do I do this, right? Just straight up. And just the community of women, female entrepreneurs, Black and Brown founders from around the country that were just at different stages of their business, but really like, are my friends now, you know, they're my friends now. And um, I learned, you know, uh, my pitch deck, how to pitch, how to carry a conversation, how to, you know, that, that I'm okay being myself, that I don't have to code switch, that I don't have to be somebody I'm not, I could just be me. And, you know, people are going to embrace that. Um, I did the pitch competition for Black Girl Ventures in LA. I won first place. I raised 65,000, the most ever raised in their pitch competitions. And actually, Omi Bell is actually signed on as my one of my advisors. So she's on my advisory board now. So that's like amazing to go from, I don't, I couldn't even type, you know? I was taking like, how do you type online classes? So to go from that to this, in this community of women, um, has been amazing. Dr. Sharita Humphrey, um, I met her in Black Girl Ventures. She's now on my advisory board and she is just financially brilliant. Um, Stefan is my financial advisor as well. He's on my advisory board. Um, let's see, there's just so many people that have come and just empowered me. Um, in San Francisco, there's an organization called SF Black Wall Street. And it's actually all girls from the hood that I'm from mm -hmm. that, you know, are doing this and it's a nonprofit. So just, you know, 
meeting with those girls, SF Black Wall Street has been amazing. Just it, it just everyone, you know, everyone. Sure. It, it's like the people you expect, those aren't the people, right? It's the people that that you need that you don't even expect. And then all these wonderful people come sure. into your life and you're like, whoa, this is really cool. <laughs> sure. I feel sure, you so mentioned, uh, You mentioned some uh, some folks there that were providing some mentorship. And it seems like, you know, you mentioned a couple of folks on your board. It, it seems like you, uh, along the way, you in, you incorporated many of them into the venture, whether that be as an actual partner uh, or whether that be people on the board, did you start with that in mind, or is that something that that came about, you know, as part of the process? Maybe did, did the Black Girl Ventures organization did they help you and and advise that? And what, what kind of things did they uh, advise other than that, other than the pitch and and things like that? If maybe you can expand on that a little bit. So I initially didn't even know what an advisory board was, right? So no, I started with nothing in mind. I started with go big or go home. I'm gonna change the standard of care and change the world. It, it'll be fine. You know, I had no idea what anything was. Um, I met Bert, obviously, and Anne Marie and Paula prior to Black Girl Ventures. Um, Black Girl Ventures was right at the start of the pandemic. And um so they have these great like customer discovery blitzes where they'll have like volunteers from PayPal or PIMCO or TikTok come in and we'll, you know, explain our business and they'll give us feedback. So it's like almost going to class, but not really, but with really high level people that are volunteering their time and just giving you honest feedback so that when I am ready and now I'm ready to go talking to go meet with investors and as I'm meeting with investors, I I know how to hone in on one thing, how to be focused, you know, because obviously I'm an inventor, my brain is all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. um, they also just like moral support, you know, when I was having a surgery, like I would get like stuffed animals from Black Girl Ventures in the mail, just like friendship, moral support. Um, nice. I had never been to a convention before um, and, the community within the community, Dana Todd Pope, she's an artist and she has a gallery and she's in the Black Girl Ventures community. And she was like, you're coming to the licensing expo in Vegas. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I was like, literally standing there, like, I don't know what to do. And she just took my hand and walked me around. And so now I feel comfortable at conventions. So it's just been, you know, all the people that work at Black Girl Ventures, right, have been just amazing. And I learned from all of them. And they're just really my community, my go-to community. I, I couldn't even, it's just been so many opportunities and doors that have opened from being a member of that community, truly. Also, you know, Cynthia Lamont, who, who, who filed, who's my patent agent, she has a background in biology. She's brilliant. So it's just like, no, I didn't start looking for people, but I attracted them and they strongly believe in my vision to stay, change the standard of care. And they see the need I'm feeling, 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 and they believe in me. And so that makes me believe in myself more. And that gives me more, you know, energy to keep going. Right. It's really great to hear that uh, that you were able to find that that community of folks that was, that was able to help you, uh, and it's also clear that you you recognize the value of intellectual property, given that you have you know these patents and you can you've continued with other innovations uh, and also the copyright and the trademark. Um, one question I would pose is, what does that intellectual property mean to you uh, in terms of its value for the business, or, or also? You mentioned generational wealth. Can you expand on what that intellectual property means to you holistically? Holistically, um, first on a personal level, right? It means that I'm empowering and bringing comfort to people. It means that I'll actually be saving lives. My sister died and lives will be saved in her name, you know? And so internally, right, that feels good. And, um, Man, that feels really good, actually, you know, and generational wealth, right? So I, I have a patent portfolio. I have, you know, I have 
four patents. I have six pending. Um, all the applications are published. And so gener I plan on, you know, licensing and monetizing them and, mm -hmm. you know, with advisors making the correct financial decisions to build generational wealth, but also yeah. to give back to my community, you know? I really want to give back to my community as well because, you know, black and brown women receive like less than 1% of venture capital dollars, right? So I really want to give back to my community because black women are strong. We know how to persevere. Yeah. We master the art of the pivot and, you know, and I really want like also people that have been incarcerated to know like to give back to them like. If I could do it, you can. You know what I mean? We all are really inventors because how many times have you thought, oh, somebody should make this? And then five or 10 years later, you're like, I thought of that, you know? And I just want people to know, like, if I could do it, you can. And maybe you're not an inventor, but maybe you want to make a clothing brand and you could get a trademark. And, you know, there's so many ways to um, monetize intellectual property, right? So. Sure. Sure, and then you bring up a great point about giving back to the community, and I, that's another one of the reasons we're really, uh, really honored to have you on. They're they're really terrific innovations with a real, uh, good public good uh, in you know as part of the the uh, innovation. Um, you, you did mention licensing as well, so that kind of leads into my next question. See, excuse me, question: uh, What do you feel are the next steps for you know the innovations that you have uh, currently and if you wanted to talk a little bit about as that applies to the um, the ones that you have uh, a patent pending status on right now. So the next steps are to um, bring in a patent monetization firm um, to, to seek licensing and deals or joint ventures with, you know, the makers of asthma inhalers, the makers of EpiPen. We are gonna manufacture and sell the drain garments um, ourselves so the next step with that would be to you know after we after we finish this round um of meeting with investors then we will you know hire the team we'll partner with the gpo or an idn and be in hospitals and have the garment prescribed you know as a part of the surgery package with insurance covering it for the patient um so the next steps are are to you know build out that structure and that sales team to sit down with the patent monetization firm and really target um licensing for all the different innovation there's so many avenues sure no that's great that's great information um we'll go ahead and end uh on uh a question for the attendees which i'm sure everybody you know usually uh likes to hear about what 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 would be uh your advice to anybody that's uh interested in uh acquiring intellectual property or has ideas for inventions uh or is just generally interested in uh entrepreneurship and some of the things that you've already done uh with your uh with your innovations do it because the people that are doing it are the people doing it which just means that there's somebody a lot smarter than me but they're not doing it and just persevere and believe in yourself and everybody may not see your vision but if you see your vision keep going and obviously it's not an easy path but nothing is an easy path in life right but it's rewarding and it's not difficult it's not complicated it's not convoluted it's just takes dedication so you have to be dedicated and you just have to do it and you may not feel like you have the experience or the expertise or the team or, or know how to do it. But if you start doing it, the people will come, the team will come, you know, you're, you're the coach of your business. And if you start doing it, you will attract the right players on your team. So just sure. do it. Great advice. Great advice. Well, you heard it here. Just, just get started from Aisha. Uh, well, we'll go ahead and end there. Thank you, Aisha. I really appreciate you coming on to talk with us. You've developed some really interesting and valuable innovations. Uh, thank you for being a part of this inaugural uh, program and have a great day. Thank you for having me. Let's go ahead and take a five minute break. Be sure to rejoin us as our next panel. We'll go over some of the great resources USPTO has that are available for you.
Welcome back. Our next panel will cover USPTO resources and will be led by Nathania Ferguson, manager for the Office of Innovation Outreach. Over to you, Nathania. Carlos, thank you for that kind introduction. We're very excited to be participating in USPTO's um, first program for our formerly incarcerated innovators and entrepreneurs. And I'm happy to have with me today two of our subject matter experts that offer valuable free resources to all innovators. So today on part of this panel discussion, we have with us Elizabeth Dorsey, staff attorney in our Office of Enrollment and Discipline, and also Robert Rob Berry, manager of our Patent and Trademark Resource Center PTRC program. And they're gonna be here today sharing with our audience valuable information about the free, yet again, valuable resources that we have available to our innovators. And we're gonna start off this discussion by kicking it off to Elizabeth to share information about our free legal resources program. Thank you so much, Nathania. Uh, let me share my presentation here. I'm so excited to share about the resources that we have. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay, great, great. So I am here to talk about the Patent Pro Bono Program. This is an excellent program that provides free legal services to inventors. We work with 20 regional programs throughout the country so that inventors can get access to free legal services. There are a lot of benefits to this program. Um, for inventors, obviously, you get to work with experienced patent attorneys and patent agents, and you get those services for free. Um, over $26.5 million in legal services have been donated through this program. Currently, we have nationwide coverage. So that means no matter where you are located in the US, you can have access to this program. Our program is administered through 20 regional programs. So they are operated by a variety of different entities. Some are operated by nonprofit organizations. Some are operated by law schools or bar associations. And each one of these programs is independent. They follow general guidelines, um, but they have their own policies and procedures. These regional programs are responsible for screening and matching the inventors with the patent attorneys. So even though each program is independent, there are a lot of similarities between um, the programs in terms of requirements for participation. And um, one criteria that is really important for inventors is the income criteria. Generally, in order to participate in the program, you need to make less than 300% of the federal poverty guidelines. We are working to increase that up to 400%, but currently, most of the programs are at that 300% level. So that means currently a single person could have an income of roughly $43,000 a year and qualify for the program. This is for a single person. If you have dependents, then that amount would be higher. There are some additional criteria as well. 
um, you may need to demonstrate that you have knowledge of the patent system, and that can be done fairly easily um, by taking a easy um, certificate training course. You also have to have an invention to participate. You may be responsible for USPTO fees, um, and you should be eligible for micro entity status, uh, which would result in an 80% reduction on fees. Um, and some programs do charge an application fee. The regional program will determine if you qualify for participation in the program. And if they determine that you meet all of the criteria, they will attempt to match you with a patent attorney who is looking to provide free legal services. And once you are matched with that patent attorney, he will help you prepare and file that patent application and the legal services will be free. Um, if the regional program is unable to match you with a patent attorney or a patent agent, um, they will let you know after a few uh, months or so that they were not able to match you. And at that point, you will be able to consider your other options. Um, so that may be uh, looking to participate in the law school clinic certification program, or you may be hiring an attorney um, on your own. So if you are interested in applying, we hope you are. You can apply directly through the regional program that serves your area. And if you have any trouble in locating your program, please email the pro bono team within the Office of Enrollment and Discipline at the USPTO, and we can be reached through pro bono at USPTO.gov. So thank you so much, and I hope that you do utilize our program. Thank you for that informative presentation, Elizabeth. Like free legal services, wow. Like we here at the USPTO, as Elizabeth mentioned, we do offer reduction in filing fees depending upon your filing status up to 80%, which is a big deal. But we are also aware that our underserved and underrepresented communities of innovators may not necessarily have a lot of resources or in their budget dedicated to the legal services. So a big round of applause for my colleagues in the patent pro bono program and law school clinic certification program that are providing free legal services. I will be following up after Rob's presentation, Elizabeth, because I have some questions for you. But I want to keep up this great momentum of sharing um, very helpful and relative free lease free resources with our audience. And now I'm going to ask Rob Berry to turn on his camera, to turn on his camera and share information about our patent and trademark resource centers. Over to you, Rob. Thanks, Nathania. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very um, happy that people are joining us for this presentation. Um, Kevin, if you could um, queue up the slides, we can take a quick uh, look at the slideshow. So this is an overview of the PTRC program, the Patent and Trademark Resource Center program. Uh, next slide, if you would. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the history of the program, where it came from, what PTRCs do, and how USPTO supports the PTRCs. Uh, next slide, please. So taking a look at the history, and we'll go forward one more. Our program 
dates back to 1871 when Congress authorized the distribution of patent documents throughout the United States. A lot of those were received by large public libraries. And in 1977, there were 22 of those. So what does that do for inventors? Well, if inventors are um, litigating their claims, they have those documents there close to a courthouse for evidence, but it also serves a purpose for somebody who's interested in applying for a patent because having that information throughout the country meant that people could go and do a patent search to see if their invention was novel, if that was the first time that that invention was invented without having to travel all the way to Washington, D.C. Um, and the picture there is kind of interesting. Those are patent models which were required to be submitted with a petition for a patent or an application for a patent um, between 1790 and 1880. So as you can imagine, throughout those decades, the number of patent models um, accumulated quite a bit. But what they discovered is once they started sending out specifications that were well drafted and carefully drafted, the need for patent models kind of was displaced with more precise documents, more precise specifications. Um, Kevin, next slide, if you would. <clears throat> um, so we can see the growth from the um, 1871 to 1990, when it went from a very small number of patent depository libraries to a larger number of patent and trademark depository libraries. And then after 2011, patent and trademark resource centers. Now, why the name change? The main reason is that the information is delivered across the internet in a digital format. So you no longer have to go in and search volumes of patent indexes to do um, a preliminary patent search to get an idea of whether your invention is novel or not before you go further. So that's a game changer. Um, with the shift from printed materials and microfilm or microfiche to digital information delivered through the internet, it means that the libraries can devote more of their time to undertaking training to become experts at the search tools and assisting people at using um, in using those search tools. Uh, next slide, if you would. <clears throat> Uh, so we see that in 2002, there were 88 in um, 2023. Today, there are 84. And if you go to www.uspto.gov and you search in the search box for PTRC, you'll get a page that talks about the program. If you scroll to the bottom and in the center, click on it, uh, it'll take you through to a map of the 84 PTRCs. And if you click on any one of them, it'll give you information to contact that library to set up an appointment. Now, what um, happens as a result of those appointments? Um, you go in and get a basic orientation to using the search tools. So if you're interested in doing trademark searching to see if you're concept for a trademark is distinctive and there's no likelihood of confusion between your concept and a um, concept that's already been registered, you can make a, an appointment and go in there and learn how to do a trademark search. The librarian will not want to do your search for you, but empower you to be able to do the search on your own. That way you can keep your ideas confidential and you can take as much time as is necessary to go through the records and see, is this an idea that I want to move forward with? Or is there another registration that's problematic? And maybe I need to go back to the drawing board and make my concept for a trademark more distinctive. 
And similarly with a uh, patent, as a result of learning how to do basic patent searching, you can get an idea if your invention is patentable, you can start to collect um, references to other patents that you'll want to include in your application. And you also um, get a better understanding of the technology, so you're better able to articulate your ideas and explain your invention to um, <clears throat> investors, uh, attorneys, if you decide to hire an attorney, and so forth. Uh, next slide, if you would. So here's a quick look on the next slide at some PTRCs in action. And we can go forward one more. Um, there's 84 of them. They're public libraries, including state libraries and academic libraries, including libraries at colleges and universities. They teach people how to conduct basic patent and trademark searches. Um, they also show people a host of different resources that are useful and in many cases can make a referral to a small business development center or some other point of contact that can help people along their journey towards um, getting branding for their goods and services or getting a utility patent or a design patent to protect their concepts. And some of these libraries um, will do public workshops and other programming. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the librarians have a wide variety of different backgrounds. They're not all science librarians or engineering librarians. Some of the PTRC librarians uh, specialize in law or business or in the humanities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's an example of a program done to celebrate Rice University's 45th anniversary as a PTRC. And on the right, there's a program for students that ties candy in with um, trademark concepts. So people can associate the good, the um, candy, with the intellectual property protection, the trademark protection. Uh, next slide. And here's one of my personal favorites. Um, I'm not a very good miniature golfer, but I love miniature golf. And these students were challenged to create their own miniature golf uh, courses. Uh, the PTRCs, whether they're located at a university or a, a public library, assist people that are members of the public that come in and want to get a basic orientation to the search tool uh, for either patents or trademarks and related resources. Now, what is the benefit of learning how to do the searching? Once you start doing the searching, not only are you better able to articulate your ideas and have a professional discussion with other people about your concepts, but you have um, a better understanding of the basic concepts you need to know. So once you start on your uh, journey, the research and information you gather is going to empower you as you go on your way. Um, and libraries as institutions have always had that function of empowering people through helping them connect with the information that they need to know. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Uh, and um, here's an example of um, a librarian teaching his colleagues how to do basic patent searching. And it's a great way to assist the public because if you share information with a librarian, that librarian in turn shares it with a larger um, array of customers, people from the public. And it's a great way to help people connect with the information. and. I don't know if people are like me when it comes to reading instructions and figuring out how to do something, but I've always found for myself, if I can sit down and somebody can show me how to do it, I can move a lot faster, especially when I'm first getting going with something. Uh, next slide. And then um, we'll um, go one slide further. 
So how do we support the libraries? We provide their training um, and we also help out with tough questions they get. And that I believe if we jump to the next slide brings us to the conclusion of our presentation. Um, and I wanna really thank um, Kevin for the support and for advancing the slides. Nathania, I'm um, gonna bounce it back to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rob. Like, wow, um, I'm not great at geography, but I had a chance to look at your map and going from 22 to 84 PTRCs. It just reminds me of the fact that USPTO, your America's innovation agency, we are dedicated to meeting people where they are. So for those that prefer like Rob and I to be in person and connect with people in person, there are PTRCs throughout the nation that are there to help provide you with the support. I have questions for you too, Rob. So I'm gonna ask Elizabeth to also come back and join us and turn on her camera and audio and um, wanna make sure that we continue to provide relevant and useful information to our audience today. So just thinking about how we just learned about Aisha McCain's amazing innovation journey and how she's been able to acquire both patents and trademarks. And I know that both of these resources that you all represent help people with acquiring patents and trademarks. So Rob, for you, just wondering, um, for those that aren't like you and I, who appreciate the in-person component of training, do you have online resources that are available 24 seven to someone that may be interested in learning more about how to conduct a search about their innovation, whether it be a patent or trademark? So I can answer your question, Nathania, in two different ways. Um, USPTO, as you know very well, has a wide variety of resources that are available through the internet. So anybody that has a um, internet connection can go to www.uspto.gov and um, click on patents and read all about the application process um, maintaining their patent once they get a patent, and the same for trademarks. Um, each library also has a web presence, and they have their own set of resources. And those vary from PTRC library to PTRC library, but I know that um, the PTRC librarian at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez has done a really fantastic job of creating um, web content that's in Spanish, including orientations to both um, patents and trademarks that are in Spanish. So if somebody um, prefers to um, read about intellectual property in Spanish, then I would direct them to the um, PTRC and Mayaguez and their online materials. And then as you go across the country, those online materials vary. Um, one um, uh, set of resources that's one of my favorites that um, uh, we created were short videos that help people use patent public search. And I'll send Nathania the link to those. And those are kind of fun to, once you start to use um, patent public search to um, search for patents, those are kind of a fun way to get a reminder of some of the basic um, searches that you can do. Well, thank you for that, Rob. And before I pivot to uh, Elizabeth, just want to clarify, because when I was looking at the map, I appreciate that a lot of the PTRCs are in public libraries, but I see a lot of them are also at universities and colleges throughout the nation. So even though you may not be a student at a specific college or university, you're still welcome to visit the PTRC for assistance, correct? 
Correct. And it's always a good idea to email or call ahead. So somebody is waiting for you and um, you can save time when you get there. So if I was going to visit a PTRC, whether it was a public library or a university library, I would probably make an appointment. I may even um, chat with the librarian over the phone and maybe um, she or he can give me some stuff to get started on ahead of time. So I already have done a little bit of searching when I get there and I can make the most efficient use of um, my time. Okay, thank you for that um, wise advice, Ron. And so now I'm gonna go to you, Elizabeth, because we know, as I mentioned earlier, and, and I'm sorry, let me pause here. I know we're going to follow up with those that have joined us but want to just make sure that you have the shortened marketing URL to learn more about the PTRC program. You simply go to usptool.gov forward slash PTRC. And as Rob mentioned, you can access the map. And although you may not be in a specific state, you may realize that a, a PTRC is actually in closer proximity to you based upon your residence. And so, um, please visit uh, USPTO 4 slash PTRC and also share that link with friends and family. So, Elizabeth, um, as mentioned, we just heard an inspirational conversation from inventor, brand owner, small business owner, entrepreneur, Aisha McCain. She has both patents and trademarks. And I know during your presentation, you made reference to more of the patent pro bono program. But you also made mention to the law school clinic certification program. Can you share with our audience the major difference between the two and why, and why someone that is an innovator may decide to not only look into the patent pro bono program for free legal assistance, but also think about consideration of the law school clinic certification program? Absolutely. The patent pro bono program is for inventors who are trying to secure patent protection. So we connect inventors with patent attorneys and patent agents for free legal services. Um, the main difference with the law school clinic certification program is that they also offer trademark services. Um, so innovators who are looking to secure um, trademark registration can work through the law school clinic certification program to get free legal services. Um, so we have a lot of law schools that participate and uh, the clinic will provide those free legal services often in both patent and trademark law. Wow, that's exciting. As a current USPTO employee, I did not get a patent, but I can get a trademark, right? <laughs> so <laughs> um, it's just always um, amazing of how we are constantly looking at ways to reduce barriers and help all innovators be successful with acquiring a patent and trademark. And I also want to highlight, I know Rob mentioned um, information that's available in Spanish language. And I, I think there was reference to that in your slide presentation, Elizabeth. But can you touch on um, how the patent pro bono program is also making sure that our innovators that are maybe more comfortable with Spanish language can also receive the uh, require or meet the required uh, criteria to be participate in the patent pro bono program? Sure. Um, one of the requirements for participating in the pro bono program is demonstrating knowledge of the patent system. And one way that you can do that is by watching an informational video, which we offer in Spanish. Um, and we also do have Spanish speaking patent attorneys who participate in the program. Thank you. I mean, I know I have to be mindful of time. I have so many questions to ask, but I know, as you all mentioned, 
Um, you have a team that is dedicated to helping our audience. And as I mentioned, the PTRC Sherton marketing URL, if you will, also want to put in a plug for the uh, uh, the means to easily access our law school clinic certification program and patent pro bono program. So those marketing links are www.uspto.gov forward slash patent pro bono for those interested in the patent pro bono program. And we also encourage you to check out our law school clinic certification program. As Elizabeth mentioned, they can help you with both your patent and trademark application process. And that is www.uspto.gov forward slash law school clinic. Uh, and so have a couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up, but just wanting to make sure that our audience as a means to contact you all after um, viewing this program. So we we understand the importance of intellectual property. And a lot of people may remember back in the day, uh, inventors and small business owners keeping a notebook and making note of their innovations, because at one point we were first inventor to file. We are now the US uh, patent system is first in first inventor to file, not first inventor, not first to invent, I'm sorry, a lot of words there. So just wondering um, what advice can you share with our audience to make sure that they have a better understanding as to why it's very important to reach out to both of these resources sooner than later. So Rob, I know you touched on searching but if you have any additional information to add to um, kindly remind people of the importance of why you need to search, that would be helpful. And then after Rob provides that information, Elizabeth, anything else you can share with the audience as to why you should consider getting um, an attorney sooner than later? So Rob, let's go with you. So, the advantage of starting your search early and gathering resources early is a patent application is a fairly difficult document to put together. It takes into account a lot of different things. And um, as you gather um, prior art that you're going to want to include in your application, you're also refining um, your understanding of what your invention is going to be and how to explain it. So when you do decide to um, contact uh, somebody for assistance, if you decide that you don't want to do it yourself, you're better able to discuss that. That having been said, you want to keep your ideas confidential. You don't want to publish your ideas or make them known publicly. Um, and you want to use, um, you know, a reasonable method to keep your ideas um, confidential. So if you're somebody who um, is going to a convention and you want to present on ideas, don't tell the audience about um, something that is going to be part of a patent application. If you do disclose it in the United States, you start a one year clock running. And if you were planning on patent protection outside the United States, you might have already precluded yourself. So um, it's nice to do a little bit of searching before you talk to a legal professional. On the other hand, the sooner you know what you need to do and how you need to know it, the less like you, likely you would be to make a costly mistake. Thank you, Rob. That's so very important because as we attend national trade shows, we understand like starting a small business is not an easy task. And we know that our innovators are looking to um, get the attention of investors. So too often we learn about these stories where they have an exhibit booth. And to your point, Rob, they're disclosing their inventions. And they're not aware of the time that's ticking and understanding that we, again, are first inventor to file. So thank you for that um, useful and relevant advice. So 
want to kick it over to Elizabeth to um, add on to why they need to consider getting an attorney sooner than later. Yes, uh, at the pro bono program, we are very mindful of first to file, which is why we try to keep things moving in the pro bono program. So an example of that is once you have applied to the regional program and you are determined to be eligible, the regional program will try to match you with a patent attorney right away um, because we do understand that it is an important thing to get things rolling under a first to file system. And if the regional program is not able to match the inventor with a patent attorney right away, then they will reach out to that inventor and let them know um, because at that point the inventor may want to try the law school clinic certification program or they may want to try a private attorney so we are very mindful of the importance of keeping the ball rolling and um, it, it is important under a first to file system Thank you, Elizabeth, and being mindful of time. Again, uh, this is a great, rich conversation, and we really appreciate you, Elizabeth, and Rob spending the time with us. But before we unfortunately have to end this conversation, um, you all, both of you have had a lot of experience working with our under-resourced, innovative innovators and small business owners and entrepreneurs Please share a, a few words of advice that you would like them to be aware of that may help them be better prepared when they are seeking out these free resources. Because it's one thing to have access and awareness that they exist, but I know I've been through situations where I'm like, if I only knew that before I contacted the resource, I would have had a better experience. So I'm going to turn it all over to you first, Elizabeth, to share any type of advice you want to leave with this audience. And then Rob, um, please share your advice. In interacting with the pro bono program and the law school clinic certification program, my primary piece of advice would be to know the primary requirements to participate in the program. Um, as I went over in the presentation, there are some general requirements for participating in the pro bono program, um, the primary one being the income requirement. So just as the first step, you'll want to check to see if you qualify under that requirement. And also for the law school clinic certification program, different law schools will serve inventors in different states. So if you just check those preliminary qualifications before you start um, down your path of, of trying to get approved for a program, um, I think it will make it easier to find the program that is there and ready to serve you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Rob? So I would say don't be a, you know, uh, afraid to explore and enjoy um, exploring. So if you're going, if you're planning to file a patent application, spend some time reading patents for similar types of inventions. It'll give you a really good idea of the application that you're going to be drafting. And if you're thinking that your business uh, would benefit from a trademark to identify and distinguish goods or a service mark to identify and distinguish the service marks you offer, take a look at some of the trademarks or service marks in other similar types of businesses. Um, ask yourself, what is it that my soon-to-be competitors are doing um, with their trademarking and how can I do something that's really special that people will notice my um, trademark or service mark and it'll be uh, distinctive. <clears throat> Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm going to add a 
a few words also. <laughs> so uh, we we connect with many innovators, thousands of innovators throughout the year. And the one thing that we encourage people: be persistent. Don't give up. We know it's not an easy road to obtain intellectual property protection, but remember, we are your USPTO, and we are here for you 24/7. I say 24/7 because in addition to our our main headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, we have regional offices throughout the area. You can learn more about those by visiting uspto.gov forward slash locations. We have uh, many training opportunities and programming to inspire, educate, and empower you. Again, you can learn more about those at uspto.gov forward slash events. And last but not least, for those that love YouTube videos, we do have a USPTO a video um, channel. And so if you're not able to um, participate in our free virtual programs, those recordings are available online 24 seven at a time that is convenient for you to watch. So please take advantage of all these free resources. We always wanna hear from you. Um, you can contact us at OIO and we can make sure Office of Innovation Outreach and we can make sure we connect you with the respective area. Um, we want to make sure that these resources are not only accessible, but we're providing you with the resources that you need to be successful with using your creative works to reach your full potential. So with all of that said, um, again, thank you, Elizabeth and Rob for spending time with us today. And I'm going to turn it back to my colleague, Carlos Gutierrez. And thank you for joining us today for this program. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you again, Nathania, Robert, and Elizabeth for sharing that wonderful information about resources that USPTO has available for the community. Next, we're going to hear about resources from the Small Business Administration. This session will be moderated by Ed Carbio. Over to you, Ed. Thank you, Carlos. Good afternoon. My name is Ed Carbio, and I work as an innovation outreach specialist for national programs here at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This afternoon, we will cover some critical resources and programs that can help innovators and small business owners maximize their potential. If you have any questions, Please feel free to put them in the chat and we will address them as many of them as we can. Now, I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing Mr. Mark Winchester, the Deputy District Director of SBA Houston's District Office. Under Mark's guidance, the SBA Houston District Office has established itself as a cornerstone of support for innovators and entrepreneurs, facilitating partnerships delivering vital programs and services, and promoting innovation. Through his leadership, innovators and small business owners have found the assistance and mentorship that they've needed to successfully navigate the complex landscape of entrepreneurship. Mark's dedication to providing access to essential resources, counseling, and access to capital has been instrumental in enabling countless entrepreneurs to thrive in a highly competitive business environment while optimizing their potential. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, my name is Mark Winchester. I'm the Deputy District Director of the United States Small Business Administration. And I'm here to present on SBA's programs and services. SBA makes the American dream of business ownership reality, and we do that by helping small businesses start, grow, expand, and recover. Next slide, please. SBA, as an agency, we have 68 district offices in 10 regions, so there is an SBA district office near you. What is considered small? SBA has size standards based on two uh, components, and they're based on NAICS code, North American Industry Classification System. Some businesses have a manufacturing NAICS code, 
And for those businesses that fall in the category of manufacturing, the size standard is 1,500 employees or less. Those businesses that fall into a retail, wholesale, those types of businesses, what is considered small is 47 million and less. Famous brands that have started with SBA assistance, and you recognize these, Buffalo Wild Wings, Apple, Intel, FedEx, Outback, Humana, Staples, all uh, started their business through SBA assistance. The SBA Resource Partner Network. The SBA has approved and funded these SBA resource partners. There's over 1,400 partners nationwide, and you can find local resource partners near you just by going to sba.gov forward slash local hyphen assistance. Which resource partner is right for you? The SBA has uh, three resource partners that include SCORE, SPDC, and Women's Business Center. For SCORE, they provide mentorship and advice. They have over 11,000 volunteers nationwide, and they offer free online workshops and webinars. The SCORE can assist with education, training, counseling, and mentoring. The SPDC, the SPDC stands for Small Business Development Center, and there are nearly 1,000 SPDC centers nationwide. The difference between SCORE and SPDC is SCORE is a volunteer organization and they provide mentorship. The SPDC, these are full-time staff, and these full-time staff can provide technical assistance regarding free business consulting, low cost training, and they help businesses to start, expand, and grow. There's also the Women's Business Center for women-owned small businesses. Currently, there are 136 women business centers across the country, and the women business centers can help you with your women-owned small business certification. They can help you with business planning, a pro forma, a market research, all the different aspects of starting or growing your business, the Women Business Center is there for women-owned small businesses. Another resource that is available to small businesses are for veterans, and the veteran stands for Veteran Business Outreach Center. And there are veteran business outreach centers across the country, and they too provide counseling and transition assistance, training and advice, and resource re and referrals. Uh, veterans, uh, write this down. You want to be aware of the SBA Office of Veteran Business Development, OVBD. And under the auspices of OVBD, this is how the Veteran Business Outreach Center is delivered to veterans across the country. Just know that there are local SBA uh, resources available to you and your local SBA district office. And you can go to, once again, www.sba.gov forward slash local hyphen assistance. So we've talked about counseling. Now we're going to talk about building capacity and uh, business development to grow and expand. Federal contracting, the world's largest customer buying all kinds of products and services is the U.S. federal government. The U.S. federal government spends between $700 billion and $3.2 trillion every year. And federal agencies are required by law to provide contracting opportunities to small businesses. You can evaluate your readiness and learn more by visiting sba.gov forward slash contract. At the federal level, these are the programs that SBA offers for small businesses 
to have diversified revenues. Agencies have a goal that 23% of all contracts go to small businesses. These programs include the 8A Business Development Program, Historically Underutilized Business Zone Program, Women-Owned Small Business Program, as well as the Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Business Program. To learn more about these programs and determine your eligibility, you can visit certify.sba.gov. Who can also help you in the aspect of federal contracting? It's your Apex Accelerator. The Apex Accelerator, I like to call it the three R's. They can assist with research, with registration, and responding, and their services are at no cost to you. Do you need access to cap capital? The SBA can help. If you need funding for your business, the SBA has SBA guaranteed back loans. They have private investors, R&D awarded funds, and surety bonds. If you're needing a loan to start, grow, or expand, SBA works with approved lenders across the country, and they offer microloans and SBA backed loans. They offer competitive terms, lower down payments, flexible overhead, and counseling and education. Know that what SBA does is provides the guarantee, and with the guarantee, it reduces risk. And by reducing risk, the lenders who participate, it reduces their risk in lending capital to small businesses. We also have lender match. You, so you can submit your application for funding for your business online, and you can just go to sba.gov forward slash lender match. And beware that when you're applying, you can apply for nearly two dozen loan guaranteed programs under the 7A program, which also includes the 504 program. And you can borrow up to $5 million. You can also get funding through private equity with private investors. You can secure capital from investors, investors partner with the SBA through the small business investment companies. And there's nearly 300 of these SBICs across the country. If you're needing funding for research and, de and development, the SBA offers every year $4.1 billion in contracts and in grants in R&D, and there are 11 federal agencies who participate. And this opens the door to early stage capital through SBIR and STTR, and you can learn more at SBIR.gov. The funding for innovation with SBIR, STTR, it includes artificial intelligence, nanomaterials, clean energy, water, excuse me, water filtration, education technology, and wearable technology. Perhaps you have a business that's in, in uh, general construction, or you're a subcontractor, the SBA has surety bonding programs that guarantee surety bonds from select providers so more small businesses can qualify and win work, whether it's at the state level or at the federal level. And you can learn more at sba.gov forward slash surety hyphen bonds. Reimagine your potential as you branch out. Another way that you can grow your business is through international trade or exporting. Did you know that 90%, excuse me, nearly 96% of consumers live outside the US? Two thirds of the world's purchasing power is in foreign countries. 
and you can evaluate your readiness and learn more by going to sba.gov forward slash exporting. And also be aware that SBA offers capital access in exporting. And we have loans, guarantee loans up to $5 million with 90% guarantee, which includes export work, working capital, uh, international loan, as well as Export Express. The SBA can help you go global through uh, counseling, U.S. export assistance, SBDCs, grants through the State Trade Expansion Program, and as I mentioned, the Export Express, Export Working Capital, and international trade loans. Triumph over adversity to recover, to help small businesses recover from disaster. Disaster happens, prepare your business. An estimated 25% of businesses don't reopen after a major disaster, and I've heard it as high as 40%. Businesses can protect themselves with an up-to-date plan of action. We call it a COOP, Continuity of Operations Plan. Prepare your business and learn more by visiting sba.gov forward slash prepare. SBA Disaster also offers SBA Disaster Loans for real estate, personal property, economic injury, machinery and equipment, inventory, and active duty military. For real estate, for uh, homeowners, it can be up to uh, 500,000. For personal property, up to 100,000. And for businesses, property damage, and economic injury up to and including $2 million. This concludes my presentation. Well, thank you, Mark. We appreciate you for taking us through some of those programs and resources and the partners that you mentioned. We do have some questions uh, that we'd like to get to. So if you're ready, uh, we'll start off. Uh, let's see, let me read these out through the chat. Uh, someone wants to know, how can I connect with an experienced mentor who can guide me in my industry? You know, that's a great question, Mr. Carballo. Uh, Mr. Carballo, the, what we have at SBA is resource partners, and that includes SCORE. As I mentioned earlier, there are 11,000 volunteers who provide mentorship across the country. And a, a, an individual, a business owner, they can visit www.score.org. And once there, they can browse or search for a mentor by industry. And uh, this is at no cost to the business owner. It's confidential and they have expertise in 63 industries. Wow, great news. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, are there specific SBA programs or services that are tailored to help underserved or disadvantaged small businesses and how can we access them? You know, uh, that's a great question. So there are programs for, for financing. There's uh, SBA has Small Loan Advantage. Small Loan Advantage is a program through private financial into institutions. These are uh, for-profit financial institutions, and they offer the small loan uh, advantage up to a uh, half a million dollars and where they get pre-qualified. And so Small Loan Advantage is for minority, women-owned, and veteran-owned small businesses. And then Mr. Carballo, the SBA also has uh, lenders who are nonprofits, and nonprofit lenders have community advantage, and community advantage minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and veteran-owned businesses can also get pre-qualified through the community advantage program, and that's just financing. There's also contracting. As I mentioned earlier, we have the 8A program, 
Hub Zone program, Women Owned Small Business program, and the Veteran Small Business Certification. And uh, uh, these programs assist businesses uh, uh, increase their revenues in federal contracting. Excellent. That sounds like some very good resources. Uh, let's move on to the next one. How can I connect with my local SBA district office to get the help I need? I'm overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. <laughs> uh, Mr. Carballo, this is a great question. And as I mentioned in the slides, uh, there are SBA resources, uh, resource partners, and SBA district offices across the country. And if they just uh, visit sba.gov forward slash local hyphen assistance, type in their zip code, they will see all the available resources to them uh, that are right nearby where they are. And uh, Mr. Garballo, when they do that, not only will they see the resource partners, the district offices, but they will also uh, see local lenders who are nearby as well. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, Mark, let's go to the next one. I'm inter uh, I, like many companies, need money to run my business. I'm looking at expanding. I'm interested in the lender match program. Could you expand a little more on how it works? You know, that's a great question, uh, Mr. Carballo. You know, there are those that say that uh, SBA is federal government, it's bureaucratic, it's too slow, and SBA did something about that. And what they did is create SBA Lender Match. And where you go is www.sba.gov forward slash lender match, and you can apply to over 300 SBA lenders who participate in the program, you uh, prepare your business plan, you upload your business plan, and you submit your pitch on Lender Match. And if there's a lender that wants to opt in, they will and reach out to you and follow up with you regarding financing for your business. So where, where can you go to reach 300 lenders simultaneously by just uploading your business plan and submitting, it's at uh, SBA Lender Match. That is a great concept, Mark. Uh, make the banks work for your business, and then you can uh, really you can compare apples to apples uh, and see who's offering better rates or incentives. Uh, speaking of incentives, um, I did read recently that the SBA is going to revise their fee schedule for fiscal year 24. Do you mind sharing with folks um, what that would be for loans up? I think there was something special about loans up to a million dollars. You Boy. know what I'm talking about? Boy, Mr. Carballo, you're with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, but you you don't miss a beat when it comes to SBA. Uh, what, we, what, you're, what Mr. Carballo is referring to is fee elimination. And every year the SBA announces what the a fee elimination is going to be for the subsequent year. And for FY 2024, Mr. Carballo is absolutely correct. You can apply up to a million dollars and the guarantee fee on the guarantee has been waived. And SBA has guarantees of 50%, uh, 75%, 85%, 90% and SBA is waiving the guarantee up to and, and including $1 million. That uh, is amazing, Mark. Uh, I couldn't even think of walking into a bank and asking for a loan for a million dollars and having them tell me that they're not gonna charge me any fee uh, for that is, uh, that's incredible. That is a big advantage. I'm glad to see that 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 was raised to the million dollar limit. I think it could help a lot of folks out. So we're running out of time here, Mark. Unfortunately, I could go on forever uh, talking with you about this stuff because it's really uh, helpful, needful information that folks need to get access to. But I just wanted to ask you, what's one thing, um, what's a common mistake that you see in working with entrepreneurs 
um, whether they're in the startup or they're trying to ramp up to that growth phase, what's kind of, um, could you give us a nugget or two of some, some general things that you see um, that don't always work out uh, the way that folks were hoping it did so that maybe we can avoid that uh, for our audience today? In regards to your question, it's a great question. There are three things really, Mr. Carballo. Number one, uh, business owners, they're, they're passionate. They're passionate about their business. They wanna start their business, but they start their business without uh, first developing a business plan. So number one, they need to develop a business plan. They need to have a competitive advantage. I like to call it the go or no go. Is the business going to be viable? And the way to do that is by developing a business plan and working with your SBA resource partner. Number two, businesses are undercapitalized. What, what I mean by that is they don't identify their total project cost. They don't identify how much working capital, how much they need in assets, how much do they need in startup cost. And so they start their business and they may get some capital, but they don't get all the capital that they, that they need. So starting a business undercapitalized. Number three, the third uh, largest issue in my opinion is lack of marketing. You're not gonna have mar uh, customers if you don't have marketing. And so part of that business plan is a marketing plan and you have to have a competitive uh, advantage. You have to have a reason why customers want to see you and then you have to deliver on that product or service. Well, those are excellent points, Mark. I appreciate it. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I would like to thank our guest, Mr. Mark Winchester, the Deputy Director of the SBA Houston office for sharing his time and expertise with our audience. Thank you again, Mark, really appreciate it. I would also like to thank each of you for spending time with us today and learning about some of the programs and services that are available to assist you on your entrepreneurial journeys. Now, I will turn the program back over to Carlos Gutierrez to take us home. Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ed and Mark. It's always great to hear about additional resources available at other federal agencies, and we're also looking forward to highlighting more of those resources in upcoming programs. Before we finish today, I did want to share some additional information about resources available at USPTO. There's, it, there's resources available for independent inventors, small business owners, and entrepreneurs. Some of the programs that we offer through our Office of Innovation Outreach include the annual Invention Con and several affinity group programs, such as the Hispanic Innovation and Entrepreneurship Event, Veterans Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Black Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program, Women's Enterprise Symposium, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Program, and others. If you'd like information about any of these programs, you can go to www.uspto.gov innovation for all. Additionally, these programs are available on the USPTO YouTube channel where you can see past events. There's also resources and assistance available through our network of regional offices. We had five regional offices and it was re recently announced that we will be adding two more, one in the Southeast region in Atlanta, Georgia, and one for the Northeast region in New Hampshire. The others are in Silicon Valley, Denver, Dallas, Detroit, and the Eastern Regional Office is co-located with headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. There's also a large network of PTRCs, which are Patent and Trademark Resource Centers. These are located at libraries and local communities throughout the country, and they can provide information on patents and trademarks. Additionally, there's a wealth of information on the USPTO.gov website to include information on patent basics and trademark basics. Also, training webinars are available and information about USPTO resources in your region. Additionally, information can be found on USPTO's hub for resources that includes how to get started, uh, things to do after you apply, how to appeal or fix an issue, and how to protect yourself, among other resources that are listed here. You can find more information on those at uspto.gov inventors. 
If you'd like to speak with somebody directly about trademark assistance or general inventor assistance, this is some information about uh, resources that are available. These phone numbers uh, are listed, are available from 8.30 to 8 p.m. Eastern time, Monday through Friday. The websites are also listed below. Additional, there's several programs for legal assistance. One of those includes the patent pro bono program that provides assistance through partnering with attorneys that will help up with the process of the application. This one does have income thresholds and you can find more information on that at USPTO.gov pro bono patents. There's also law school clinic certification programs that allows law school students to practice law, trademark law and patent law before the USPTO while providing those services to applicants pro bono. There's also a great pro se program that allows applicants to speak with uh, USPTO attorneys uh, that will provide assistance with their patent applications if they want to submit applications without the assistance of a, an attorney externally. This is a great resource, certainly one of the ones that's available also by signing up for alerts. Uh, this provides a lot of information on upcoming events. As you can see, there's a lot of them listed here. Every month, many of the offices within USPTO put on programs. More information can be found about that at USPTO.gov slash events. One of the newest tools that USPTO has is called the USPTO identifier. It allows you to go through by answering six brief questions and learn basic information about uh, intellectual property and what type of intellectual property you may have uh, at the early stages so that you can know which routes to take. You can find out more information at ipidentifier.uspto.gov. Uh, these are alert the alerts I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a great source of information about uh, updates, things that are new in legislation, uh, patent alerts, trademark alerts, and also things that relate to copyrights. We want to thank everyone again for joining us today, and a big thanks to all of our program participants. If you enjoyed today's program, be sure to log in at our events page and check out upcoming events at www.uspto.gov slash events. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Have a good day.